Yo, Thomas, we have a problem. What is it? The software broke again. On prod? No, just a dev. Of course on prod. No worries. I got your back. Hello and welcome fellow coders. Thanks for joining me today. Writing unit tests for your code is an essential part of being a good programmer. Today I'm going to explain to you how you can write unit tests for your Golang code. This is going to be a complete beginner's guide, so if you have no experience whatsoever, no worries, I got you covered. First, I'm going to explain how you can write your first unit tests and then I'm going to show you some advanced techniques and give you some more tips. So without further ado, let's get into the code. I prepared a super simple project containing a calculator package as well as a main file. The calculator package contains one file which only has one function. This is going to be the function we are going to write the tests for. The main file simply calls the divide function and prints out the result. Running the main file could actually be used to test our code. But just because you can do it, does not mean you should do it. Today we are going to write some real tests. The first thing we need to do is to create a new file for our tests. In Go, Test files are put right next to the actual files. This has to do with how the Golang compiler works. It recognizes files that have the underscore test suffix as test files. So test files are usually called the same way as the regular files followed by the underscore test suffix. If you define a package they are going to live in, Golang provides you with two options. The first option is the same package as the actual code. And the second option is to put our test code into a specific testing package, which is called the same way as the actual package plus underscore test. There is an actual difference between these two types of packages. If you put your code in the same package, you can test it as if you were writing white box tests, meaning that you have access to the unexported functions of the package you are testing. On the other hand, if you put your test code in a designated test package, you only have access to the exported functions the package provides. If you did not fully understand what I'm talking about, no worries, I will come back to this part again. I think you will get a better grasp as soon as you see it in action. Let's begin with the black box tests and put our testing code into a separate package. In order to write tests for your functions, Golang has a pretty straightforward convention. You simply start the name of your test function with test and the Golang compiler recognizes that this function is going to be a test function. See how my IDE already recognizes that the function I'm about to write is going to be a test. Next you put in the name of the function you are going to write the test for. In our case it's a divide function. It's a best practice to name your test functions the same way as the regular functions prefix with test. Test functions only have one parameter usually called t. It's of type capital T from the testing package. t manages the state of tests, so every single test function you write needs to have the t parameter. There are other types than t, but for unit testing you 99% of the time use t. Next, let us talk about the basic structure of a unit test. Every single unit test consists of three sections. An arrange section, an act section and an assert section. The first section is where you set up your test. You will define all the things you need in order to execute and run your code. Usually, you also define the expected outcome of your test. The second section is where you call the functionality you want to test. And the last section is where you assert that the actual output of your function is the same as the expected. So when writing your tests, always keep the structure in mind. Arrange, act, assert. Ok, now let's finally write our test. First, we define the expected outcome. I'm going to divide 10 by 5. So if there haven't been any major mathematical breakthroughs since my first grade, the outcome should be 2. The expected outcome is usually stored in a variable that's called expected. Next, we call the function we actually want to test and store the outcome into a variable. As I said, I'm dividing 10 by 5. Now all we need to do is to compare both values and call the error function of t in case they are not the same. It is important to make the error message as explicit as possible, since you want to see on first sight what your expected outcome was and what the function call returned. Ok, this is basically it for our first test. Remember what I told you about the basic structure of each unit test, the range act assert part. This small little test is a perfect example about how to structure your tests. It has an act, an arrange and an assert part. Even though this test function is very small and concise, it still has all three parts. To run your tests, you need to call the test command of the go toolchain followed by the path of the package you want to test. In our case it's the calculator package. The output tells us that all tests of this package have passed and that it took 0.005 seconds to execute the tests. If you want to have a little bit more information you can pass the dash v argument to the test command. This way you can see which test functions actually get called. This might be important if you have a lot of tests and want to figure out which takes long to execute. Just for the sake of it, let me quickly show you how a failing test would look like. If I change the argument right here and run the code again, you can see that the output clearly states that my tests have failed. And it also prints the message I passed to the error function. 
Before we jump to the second test, let me quickly change this back to 10. As for our second test, we are going to test that the outcome of a division is negative if the divisor is negative. I know, this isn't like the best test case ever, but for the sake of this tutorial, let's just go with it. We are going to start the name of the function as before, but this time we are going to be a little more precise on the name of the function. Usually, if you want to be more declarative with the name of your tests, you can simply continue using the camel case but you sometimes see it separated by an underscore. Both naming conventions are fine, just make sure that you pick one and stick with it. I'm going to continue with the camel case. First I define my expected value to be minus 2. The call of the function looks identical, besides the fact that the divisor is negative 5 this time. But the third part is completely the same. Oh shoot, I forgot to add the testing parameter, my bad. Running the tests now gives us the output for both test cases. And as expected, both passed. If you now take a look at both tests we wrote, the only things that are different are the expected result and the divisor. The rest of the code is identical. This is actually a problem. Imagine you need to change the signature of the function that you are testing. This would force you to change every single test case. At the moment we only have two. But in the real application it might cost you hours to change your tests. The good thing though is that Golang provides us with an easy way to reuse repetitive test cases. This is called parameterized testing and we will make use of it. The concept is pretty easy. You take everything that differs in each of your tests, put it into a slice and iterate over it while testing. Let me show you how this would look like. First, I'm going to define the test cases. This is a slice of anonymous structs which defines each test case. Every single test case will have a name. The other fields are the ones that are different for each test we wrote. So it is the expected value as well as the divisor. We will define the slice as a literal and directly fill in the test cases. For our first test case, the name is simply division. The expected value is 2 and the divisor is 5. This slice will hold all our test cases. Now let's change the test division function so that it uses the test cases. First we need to iterate over the test cases slice. Next we call the run function of the testing parameter. You can see right here that it takes a name string as a first argument and a function with a testing parameter as its second argument. We can take the name from our test case. As for the function, let's simply copy and paste the test we wrote before and take the expected value as well as the divisor from our test case. And that is basically it. Let's run our test to make sure everything still works. The test still passed and you can see in the output that the division test got executed as part of the test division function. To add a second test to our test cases, we now simply need to extend the slice. Let's put in the values for our second test. This way we can get rid of all these lines right here. We basically replaced a whole function by just one line. Running the tests again shows us that both test cases got executed and passed. As for our next test case, we need to bend the laws and taste the forbidden fruit of math. We are going to divide by zero. Let's simply add the test case for that. First the name, second the expected value. I simply add a random number since it's going to fail anyways. And as for the divisor, it is zero. Running the test already shows us that the real value is actually infinite. To prevent that, let's change the divide function of the calculator so that it returns an error in case the divisor is zero. First the check, return an error, division by zero. We also need to add the error as a return type and fix both the return statements. If we go back to our test function, the function call now returns two values. Let's call them got value and got error. And we also need to change them right here. Now we can check if the divide function returns an error and if so, we can compare it to an expected error. Which we also need to define. So let's add it to the test case struct and fill in the values for the error in the test cases. Running the test should still fail. If I scroll up a bit you can see that the test now fails in two points. First at line 30 because the errors are not the same even though the message is identical. And second at line 35. This is because the divide function now returns 0 as the value in case an error is returned. And I did not change back the expected value in the test case definition. The second one is an easy fix. Change that back to 0 and here we go. Only one failure left. But that one is kind of tricky. Since two instances of a new error get created, one in the test case and the other in the divide function, they are actually not the same. So comparing them results in false. One way of solving this is to compare the error strings of both errors. Running the tests again shows us that it works, but it looks very ugly though. There are a couple of things you can do now. You can just leave it as is, 
write a helper function or define a specific error you can use to type check the result. Or you can do it the easiest and most elegant way and simply use Testify. Testify is a Golang library which comes with a whole lot of helper functions that improve your testing experience. Even though there are more testing libraries out there, Testify is the one library you will find everywhere since it's super powerful and easy to use. Let me quickly show you what I mean by that. First we need to download the Testify dependency. Simply type in go get github.com slash stretcher r slash testify and press enter. In our test we first need to create an instance of an assertion. This makes sure that every single test run starts from scratch and nothing is stored in a testing state. This way each test run is independent from another. One cool thing about testify assert is that it has a lot of functions that help us assert different kind of variables. For instance, we could use different types of error assertions to do all the things I was talking about earlier, like for instance type assertion. But for simplicity's sake, let's just use equal and pass the expected error as well as the returned error. We can do the same for the expected and the returned value. Let's get rid of this line too, since we don't actually need it. Look how pretty our test has become. This is the power of Testify. And to be honest, we didn't even scratch the surface. If you want to learn more about Testify, please let me know in the comments down below. Then I will definitely create a tutorial for the Testify package. It's absolutely worth learning. But we should run the tests again and see if they are still passing. Okay, this looks good. The next thing I would like to show you is how to test unexported functions. If we have a look at the divide function, we could take the check and put it into an unexported function. Let's call it is0, put in the check and change it right here. Now if we would like to call the is0 function, it is only possible from inside the calculator package. So if you wanted to write tests for it, we are not able to call it. This is because our tests reside in the calculator underscore test package. If we change the package to calculator, we now have access to the is0 function. Do you remember what I told you in the beginning of this tutorial? We now switched from black box to white box testing. Before we write the whole test, let's do it the correct way right from the start. What are the test cases that should be tested? The value could either be 0 and the result should be true, or the value could not be 0 and the function should return false. Let's put these two cases into a test case slice and use parameterized tests again. Let's call it is0 test cases. First we need a name for our test runs, then the expected value then the expected result and the argument of the function call. The first test case should test the true path and the second should test the false path. Now let's finish the test real quick. First iterate over the test cases, pass in the name, create a new assert instance, use it to assert equality and finally call the function. But before we run the test, we need to change the function call in the divide test. We can get rid of the package name right here. Ok, now let's give it a shot and as you can see all tests have passed. There's one final thing I would like to show you. At the moment we only run our tests for the calculator package. But in almost all cases you want to run tests for all packages. You can do that by using three dots after the slash. This way all tests for all packages get executed. And there's another thing. Sometimes you want to execute just one test of a specific package. You can use the dash run flag to specify the function you want to execute. This way only the test is zero function gets executed. We can do the same for the divide function so only the divide function gets executed. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something today. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel so you never miss out on any new content. And until next time, keep on coding.